I don't see anybody smiling though, right? So, uh, Brian Wilkin with your Bahama Breeze, you better be smiling back there, right? Well, Silva, with that nice, comfortable chair, you better, you better be, better be smiling. Yeah, I what's happening? They're all good you. to see you, my friend. I hope it'll be smiling when I tell you how to avoid paying income tax. Um, Usually when people go to see the tax man, everybody's smiling, right? Everybody's happy to see him. Everybody's excited, right? Yeah, it's a funny it's a funny thing, Dutch. You know, when you tell people you're a tax lawyer, people's eyes glaze over. But when you tell them that you fight the IRS for a living, they want to buy you a drink, you know? So it's, uh, it all depends which side, side you're on. Very good. How so many, How many do we have joining us? Um, you know, we'll probably have close to 100 today. It's usually, usually pretty normal for one of one of our crowds, right? There's about 65, 66 people on right now. So, okay, great. Very cool. You know, this is interesting because this is the first time we've done a podcast with an audience. So this should be a little bit fun, a little bit, a little bit different. And I really wanted you to come on, James, because so many of our people had questions about opportunity zones about opportunity zone funds, about taxation when, when it comes to investing, ways to defer taxes, ways to keep taxes, right? And, you know, guys, James is, is a person, you know, with a lifetime experience in, in accounting, tax accounting, um, being a tax lawyer, correct, James, as well, and, and fighting the IRS, working within the IRS. He's been on every side of the facet. And so I, I went through a long, hard search to find um, – what an opportunity zone fund was. It's interesting. One of our own inner circle members, one of our own high end investors had just sold a business. And he said, Dutch, I've been investing with you for a long time. And he goes, I want to take, you know, the money I made from investing with you. And I want to invest it in an opportunity zone fund. And I said, well, I said, Ted, we better figure out how, what an opportunity zone fund is and how it works and all of the details. Right. And so, you know, opportunity zone fund that we opened up about three weeks ago is interesting because it's our it would be our fifth fund it is our fifth fund that we've opened up and it'll be our fifth fund we make money with and so i'm excited you know for all of you to be able to ask him questions but essentially you know it's the best way that i found you know to be able to defer capital gains taxes it's the best way to be able to you know protect future returns um from your capital gains taxes that i've seen out there and maybe you know james has some insight into some other ways to do that as well but I wanted you guys to be able to ask them questions and I wanted you to be able to, to be able to get in there. So go ahead and start filling up the chat room, filling up the question box and start asking questions. But James, tell people about, you know, your background and history and those kind of things, even though, you know, they kind of kind of know a little bit, a little bit. We sent out a brief bio as well to people. So. OK, well, the first thing I should explain is my English accent. Uh, as you hear, I don't come from around here. Uh, I grew up in England, but I've lived in the United States for the last 35 years, and I've been a tax lawyer. I went to Harvard Law School class in 1990, and I've been in law practice ever since. I haven't actually worked for the IRS, uh, but I've had a lot of dealings with them over the years. Um, I've worked at a number of uh, large firms, most recently at uh, Sherman & Sterling, big Wall Street uh, law firm. I was tax counsel in the DC office, uh, and I've been part of Potomac Law Group for about the last seven years. Potomac Law Group is a law firm of about 120 lawyers, all of whom used to work for big bricks and mortar law firms, but now everybody works from home. Uh, this is the uh, a sign of the times. So some of them in the, some of them are mums at home who don't want to work horrible law firm hours. Others are people like me at the uh, later stages of their career. We have people in the middle as well. But uh, if you look at our website, potomaclaw.com, you'll see that uh, we have an impressive range of lawyers, pretty much covering the gamut of everything that you would expect from a DC law firm. Not all of our people are in DC. We've got a few up in New York and New England. We've got one or two in California and, and scattered around. But they all come basically from big law firms, or in a few cases from big in-house legal jobs. Um, and so James, that's, that's kind of where you came to us, right? You came to us from our law firm. We went to our law firm that you know has done more reggae's than any other law firm in America, and has yeah, done I, done more offerings like ours. And so I, you know, said to him, I said, I really need. Um, to talk to an accountant on this, and they, they brought me to you. Yeah. Um, my law firm has a relationship with a, a number of um, securities firm, firms that do reggae and other types of security offerings, uh, but they generally don't have a tax person in-house. So we have an arrangement with these firms whereby uh, I'm asked to uh, address tax questions and field reviews of uh, offering documents and so forth. So I sort of serve as the tax counsel and tax advisor to, to a number of these firms. 
um, and uh, you know some of it's international, some of it's uh, you know securities matters, um, some of it's tax accounting, a, a variety of things that uh, that crop up. Um, but uh, that's that's how I come to uh, I come to be doing this and working with you, Dutch. Yeah. All right, James. Let's so let's get let's get to it, my friend. What is your favorite color? My favorite color is <laughs> red. Just kidding. Is what? That. I always ask that question. I say my favorite color is red, but I don't get asked it very often, you know. There you, you go. Know, when you're a single girl to ask you that, but uh, not anymore. Um, so let's get to it. Define for everybody what an opportunity zone investment fund is. Right. What an opportunity zone. It's, it's called technically a qualified opportunity fund. Uh, and there's a related concept of a um, of qualified opportunity zone. Um, the basic idea is that there is a statute passed by Congress in 2017 that's entitled, uh, or at least part of it is entitled, uh, Section 1400 Cap Z-2, strange number, Special Rules for Capital Gains Invested in Opportunity Zones. And the basic idea is that if you have a capital gain that you have realized that you would otherwise have to pay tax on in, in some years starting after 2017, and you wish to defer the payment of tax on this capital gain, you can invest the funds, the, the, the amount of the gain, not, not everything that you got from the, the sale, but the amount of the gain, you can invest in a qualified opportunity fund, which is an investment vehicle, generally a partnership or a corporation that is investing in either another uh, qualified opportunity corporation or partnership or a business that is operating uh, and investing in one of a large number of qualified opportunity zones around the country. These are by and large depressed areas, uh, areas that are in need of redevelopment, inner city areas, uh, generally uh, areas that have suffered from underinvestment in the past. Um, you know, it's not uh, downtown Manhattan, it's, uh, you know, the outskirts of Detroit and, but, it, you know, that, actually that puts it too badly. Some, some of them are, you know, the, the center of Oklahoma City, I know, is one of them. There, there are a lot of these, uh, there are strict criteria in uh, the preceding section of the code as to uh, what these zones are and how they're classified. Uh, and there is actually a list that the IRS has provided, uh, and they're all sort of defined uh, very precisely as to, to where they are. And the idea is that from an investor's point of view, um, the benefits that you get from making this investment are that you do not, provided that you reinvest the amount of the gain within 180 days, you get to defer recognition of the gain until either you essentially liquidate the investment or until the last day of the year 2026. Uh, which essentially gives you, uh, well, from now gives you just over five years to um, to defer payment of the gain, in which case you would pay tax on the rate applicable to the gain in 2026, whatever that will turn out to be. Um, it won't necessarily be the rate that's there at the moment, and you should be aware that rates may change and it might not be so favorable in 2026. But the, the deal is you get to defer it. There was a couple of additional benefits. In fact, there's three additional benefits in there. Uh, when it started, the, the deal was that if you um, invested in, um, in, in this and you held the, the asset for, for, um, for five years, you would get a 10% uh, reduction in the uh, amount of the gain that you had to recognize. Um, that uh, is no longer available because uh, it only applies to the recognition of the gain that occurs on or before December the 31st, 2026. Uh, and you, it's now too late for the for the uh, seven for the seven year uh, period that was necessary to um, you had to hold it for that. Uh, it's still possible though to get a further five percent gain uh, reduction in basis, uh, so that you know if you've got hundred thousand gain, you only pay tax on ninety five thousand of gain uh, if you invest by the end of this year. Uh, it doesn't give you very long since the end of this year is now only a few weeks away, but uh, that would um, reduce the amount of tax that you have to pay on the deferred gain on. Uh, by the end of 2026. But the really big one is that if you hold this investment for 10 years, uh, you essentially step up the basis when you sell it to the fair market value of the, the sales price at the end. So if you have $100,000 of gain um, right now, if you were to invest it now, you would get that reduced to 95,000 that you would have to recognize on December the 31st, 2026. But then if you sell it for $200,000, um, 
you have got uh, all that additional gain that you've got above your um, $95,000 basis that you've acquired when you pay tax on it. All the rest of it is tax free. You don't have to pay any tax on it at all. But for to do that, you have to hold it for 10 years. Now, obviously, uh, holding something for 10 years is a long time. And the fact is that you've got your money invested in some of the uh, not greatest areas of the, of the country. But uh, the, the tax benefits associated with this are, as you see, pretty substantial. And there aren't a lot of other ways around uh, deferring uh, the recognition of, of capital gain and paying tax on it. Um, at the moment, there have been in the past, but many of those loopholes and opportunities have been closed. So this one really stands out as being a particularly uh, attractive one. So the deal is you have to have a capital gain. It doesn't work for ordinary gains. Uh, there's a little bit of um, hair on that in that, uh, you know, what happens if you've got offsetting gains and losses, if you've got Section 1231 gains, which are gains on uh, depreciable property used in the business and so forth. But, but essentially the rule is that if you have capital gains that, uh, that you realize, you have 180 days to invest the amount of that gain. Generally, you do this in cash, but you can also do it in property if the, the fund will agree with this. And you have to invest that amount uh, in a qualified opportunity fund, which is a corporation or a partnership that's set up in order to invest either in other um, entities that, uh, that are investing in opportunity zones or that operates a business where substantially all of the uh, assets and activity are engaged in a qualified opportunity business, which essentially means developing property developing real estate, developing um, a tangible property associated with that real estate, you know, for example, setting up a hotel in one of these places. Um, there are a lot of rules that relate to the fund as to what the fund is, um, is allowed to do. The fund, um, which we don't really need to go into because they don't really affect the investor very much, uh, the, the fund is required to maintain 90% uh, of its assets in qualifying um, property for at least uh, substantially or which in that case means 70% of the, the time of the holding period. The fund can be subject to penalties if, uh, if it doesn't maintain this, but it wouldn't affect your rights as investors to, um, you know, to get the tax benefits that I have, have talked about. Um, there's a fair amount of paperwork with this, as you might expect with uh, anything. I mean, highly unlikely, given Big Ten and Conference Europe. I'm sorry? Um, that wasn't me, James. I think somebody got unmuted for a second. Um, okay. Probably somebody trying to ask a question, but but go ahead. Keep, keep going. We'll, we'll, we'll open it up to questions all at once. I mean, I keep one, I keep one to interrupt and, and ask questions, and then I keep myself... Well, I, as I say, that's, you know, I, I think I've basically laid out the, 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 the plan. The, the, the statute was enacted in 2017 by, by Congress. Um, it's, you know, relatively detailed as, as statutes go. These days, uh, statutes are more detailed than they, they were at one time. Some of the older sections of the code are very short indeed. Uh, but what does happen nowadays is the regulations are extremely voluminous. There have been, I think, three sets of uh, regulations, and there's still some regulations out there that are proposed addressing various uh, fine points uh, in the application of, of these rules, uh, many of which go to what happens in circumstances where these rules interact with other rules in the code, where you've got stock splits and you know, dividend issues and um, issues relating to S corporations and, and so forth, um, which, you know, if those apply to you, you need to look at the rules or work with your advisors to uh, make sure that uh, it's working the way that it's supposed to work. And the fund clearly needs to be advised that uh, they need to stay within the rules as well. Um, and, uh, you know, there are a lot of faults in this and there are a lot of um, traps for the unwary. Um, but as I say, you know, this does actually work. Uh, and these have been very successful across the country. There are uh, a good number of qualified opportunity funds that are in, in, in place, some of them just in one city, some of them buying properties and developing properties all over the country. Um, and uh, I'm here to tell you that it uh, it really does work as long as you, you follow the rules and you know you, you determine the amount of your gain. Uh, if you actually realize one other point, I'll make it, then I'll stop and you can ask me questions. One other point is that if you sell the property yourself and realize the gain, this would this doesn't have to be gain on real estate. This can be capital gain on just about anything, cryptocurrency, um, anything that's a capital asset. That's to say, not a, an inventory asset. Anything that's a capital asset, an investment asset. Uh, if you get capital gains distributions from a RIC or a REIT or something like that, or flowing through a partnership, you generally get a bit longer with 180 days not beginning until the end of the taxable year in which that gain would otherwise be, be recognized. Um, so there's a little bit of, bit of slack there. But again, say you have to look at your individual circumstances to see how this will work in situations that are not totally plain vanilla. 
So there's oh, there's one there's one really important point there. So you know, if they get a capital gain from a REIT, right, they can move it into the opportunity zone. So anybody who's invested with Rad Diversified, right, we just said like a crazy third quarter, like 12.99% for the third quarter. And, and so we're over 30% per year. So if you have a, if you wanted to make a withdrawal from Rad Diversified and then move it into the opportunities zone, the gain, right, into the opportunity yeah. zone, um, you could always rebuy stock, right, with your original capital you pulled out and then put the gain into the opportunity zone and then you could do the t- the the you know the defer the deferment of the capital gains and you also can get the 10 years right um with with the returns and so that's that's really incredible right and so i have to also be careful i know michael my mic's two or three times louder than james there's not a lot of adjustment i can i can make make with that one for you right now um but you probably have to adjust yeah. your mics a little bit so i apologize i'll try and talk a little that's bit it. for you though yeah, um, I mean, the basic, the basic, the basic rule is it's got to be a capital gain. And the fact that it comes to you through a pass-through entity, through uh, an S-corporation, a RIC, or a REIT, um, d- doesn't well, essentially make any difference. Uh, there, are some, there are some technical requirements. But basically, yes, if you have got a gain like that, you need to reinvest it with, within 180 days. The interesting question being when that 180 days actually starts, because if, you, within your, you know, if you, you're in a partnership and the partnership sells something, um, and uh, you know, this then there's the question whether the partnership claims the uh, exemption or whether um, you know you can, but whether or not the partnership claims it, you can actually claim it your, yourself with special provisions that govern that situation. But yeah, so since the uh, next if there's a capital gain that would be recognized by you, you can defer it by investing in a, in a qualified opportunity fund. So, in the next, in the next 20 days, right? Um, we things are moving really oh, 24 days right before January 1st. There's some things moving really fast. So any of our investors who have a capital gain that they want to move that quickly, especially with us specifically, right through Red Diversified, yeah. just make sure you get in touch with with Gretchen and the investor relations team, and we'll we'll make the effort to make that switch over for you before January 1. So just just let us know. Um, it, w- w- we have to process a few things quickly on our end. We'll yeah. we'll make that effort for you guys. Um, you know, there's a couple of things James talks about in, and, you know, we'll see whether, you know, the government, you know, um, extends, right, the five-year period in, in 2026 or whether they end it or not, right? I, I, I really believe that there's not a tax shelter alive that the politicians don't want to continue to extend. I also think, you know, we'll have different things that are going on economically four to five years. And it's one of the ways to stimulate the economy is to keep people doing transactions. When people stop doing transactions, it slows down the economy. Um, I do always do the caveat when we're, especially when we're on a, a webinar like this, right? I'm not a financial advisor, accountant, or a lawyer. I'll give you the best advice from a, from a lifetime of experience of investing from from my background and stuff. And so, you know, let's jump into some of the questions. Um, and I found, you know, one of these, you know, fairly interesting, James. Um, Lisa, you know, Lysine said, if I invested in property using my joint checking account with my spouse, I received the profits through my LLC, would that be sufficient for the IRS to view my gains as income earned by my LLC and not by myself or husband or individual? Um, it's a little bit unclear what the, the situation is there. Yeah, I invested my properties using okay so so Lisa has a um an LLC that um that she has jointly with her husband um and that's an LLC owned jointly by a husband and wife is, is actually treated as a partnership for tax purposes and is expected to file a partnership tax return. Uh not everybody knows that but that is in fact the rule. Um there is an exception if you just have a plain partnership but an LLC owned by a husband and wife is supposed to file a tax return. Uh, but yes, I mean, if there's a capital gain in the LLC and it flows through and you would be putting it on your individual return, Lisa, or on your joint return with your husband, yeah, that's a capital gain that you can you can defer. I like that a lot. And so even if they don't, even if they don't sell a property, um, try to keep yourselves muted as best you can. That's somebody running two computers in the same room. That might be, might be you too. Um, so I think that's really interesting. So even if they make income into an LLC, they can count that income into the LLC as a capital gain. Well, as long as it's capital gains income, I mean, okay. if so only if from the sale of an asset, the LLC, 
Yeah, you've got it. You well, yes. I mean, there are other ways you can get capital gains, but uh, the default rule is that every asset is a capital gain unless some. What are the other ways to? Price. What are the other ways to get capital gains? Well, you could sell stock. You could sell. Um, you could sell a building. You could sell. Um, so you might even be able to. We'd call those assets, but I'm with you. Yeah. I guess yeah, one's assets, a security, yeah. one's I mean, an asset. Yeah, but yeah. Basically, basically um, you know, you, if you, you sell anything, I mean, if you sell sell your collection of uh, fine china or coins or something. Or artwork, you okay. Capital if, they're not, if, if, they're not, if they're not held, you know, it, it, as inventory or held for sale to customers. So, you know, what you, if, you, you know, if you're buying and selling widgets, then the widgets are inventory and you don't get a capital gain when you sell them. That's ordinary income from running the business. Um, but if you... Um, you know, but if you own a building or you, uh, you know, you own a painting or you, you, you know, you sell something, that's generally a capital gain. Uh, and the fact that it's done in an LLC doesn't really make any difference except with possible timing issues. Um, but it's still, as long as it's a capital gain, uh, you can reinvest it and it will flow through to you to your return. And instead of reporting it this year and paying tax on it this year, you can defer it for, for five years till 2026. So you, you have to invest the amount of the gain. Celia so Tong asked if you have to be an accredited investor to invest in an opportunity zone. Uh, no, you don't. Um, but that's not exactly my um, my area. Um, yeah, so I kind of ran into this with the well, lawyers, you, you, yeah, lawyers a little bit, so James. Excited. Right. I think most lawyers believe that most people that would have capital gains would be accredited, and I think it's the lawyers not maybe not being quite up to date. Yeah on modern society, right? In modern society, there's a lot of people with capital gains that aren't accredited, especially in the crypto world, right? Um, and the selling of stock, I think there's there can be a lot of, of that, right? Um, and so, yeah, you, you don't have to be um, accredited to invest in an opportunity zone or invest in an opportunity zone property. Another person said, um, do you have to have, if you have a Roth IRA, does that limit to, limit to my need to be in an opportunity zone fund if I invest with RAD through through an I, a Roth IRA? The answer is yes, you, you don't need to do the opportunity zone fund if you're investing through an IRA and that, that can eliminate um, your, your capital gains, capital gains taxes with that. Um, another question is, is there a specific tax form for the OZ? Um, also Turbo, TurboTax doesn't support OZ, um, so I will need to have a tax preparer handle this every year that I carry the OZ fund. Uh, yeah, you probably you probably will. Um, if you if you got enough money to be investing in, in opportunities, I mean, this doesn't make sense to do for you know twenty five dollars. This you know this is only worth doing if you've got a significant amount of gain that you're talking about. Um, but sorry, my wife is handing me a cup of coffee. Um, so this next question is definitely for me, right? So Lynn Buter said, I want to know if the company goes bankrupt, how are we guaranteed our money back, and how long would it take? To get back. So, you know, Lynn, I always, uh, let me start with past performance does not indicate future performance, right? That's one of my SEC, you know, declarations I have to do, you know, um, been in business, you know, 15 years. Um, we, this would be our, this is our fifth fund that, that we've opened. The first three uh, were opened and, and closed and, and paid out all investors. Uh, the fourth one is an ongoing uh, registered security with the SEC, right? Um, it's a non-traded public stock with the SEC. Uh, we've been qualified uh, since 2018. Um, every time our stock price increases by more than 20%, we have to requalify with the SEC. We've done it four times um, over, over those years. And every single time we have to submit financials, uh, those financials are audited to the SEC. Um, and, and so, you know, in this game of investing, could you ever lose money? Yes. Anybody who says that to you is full of crap. In this game of investing, is there always risk? Yes. Uh, anybody who doesn't say there is, is full of crap. Anybody says that this is the perfect thing, the end all be all to the end of time is full of crap. What I can say is, is that, you know, we have a very unique and special relationship with our investors. Our staff and team are, are incredible. Um, they work their butts off, right, um, to, to not only get our investors returns, but to protect and safeguard our investors in every aspect, every way we can. Um, for example, like one of the biggest, you know, exposures or risks um, in investments, right, would be lawsuits and suit and lawsuits that could come at you, you know, everything from a slip and fall to a, to a tenant who, you know, 
electrocuted their fingers in a, in a light socket, right? And so one of the best protections we have when it comes to those types of things is our insurances, right? We have both general liability insurance across the board, but we also have individual homeowners insurances and we make our renters get their own insurance, right? To, to make sure that those kind of things are safeguarded in, in um, a decade of, of doing this, right? Um, we've had, we've had you know, no outstanding you know, lawsuits that had to go to court ever. Um, in the history of it. I think we've had a few people that sued us um, because they said we didn't shovel our uh, sidewalk in front of our driveways and, and, and our, our uh, insurance company settled those, you know, each time for like five grand um, because it's easier to settle it for five grand than it is to um, try and fight, fight those, those kind of lawsuits. And I'm not opening it up to the world to sue us to get five grand. But at the same time, those things have been the rarest of things, I think twice um, in, in a decade of, of doing business. And, and both times, I think they felt, I felt like they were scams. Um, and so, you know, here's the thing is we try to monitor cash flow to make sure our cash flow can cover our debts and cover, cover our challenges, no matter what is going on, you know, economically. 2020, during the middle of a recession, during the worst uh, economic situation we had been in since 2008, um, we, we made double digit returns. We made crazy returns better than any other fund out there. Right. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, November, October, November, December last year, when things started to good, I'm talking about January, February, March, April, May, June. Um, when, when stuff hit the fan, we made great returns. And so, you know, what I would say is, you know, we do everything in our world to thrive during difficult economic times. It's the number one core principle of our diamond five core principles as a company, our survivalist project you should look deeper into is one of our investments. And that's a counterbalance to economic strife and economic, um, challenge. So let's keep going. Uh, do you need to consider amount of capital to invest in OZ funds? So our minimum capital, investment, I believe, into our OZ fund is $10,000. Um, you know, you could invest if there was a fund open, right, for an OZ fund, um, you can invest whatever their minimum investment is. Our minimum is, is $10,000, right? Is there going to be a monthly outdraw setup when an account reaches a certain certain level? Um, Alan, you know, the answer to that in the OZ fund is no uh, within the RAD REIT. The answer is yes. I'm still new to learning about RAD Diversified, how involved are your investors in finding deals and managing the real estate properties? Um, so it depends on what part of RAD diversified you're a part of, Gail. So, you know, with RAD REIT, you have, you know, our investors have, it's 100% automated when it comes to you as an investor, right? We find the deals, rehab them, we property manage them. Um, we do all of this, you know, in-house. Um, we we take the entire process from start, start to finish. You're a completely passive investor. Our inner circle members can can be more active um, should they choose to be. Um, I've always said to people, I'm never going to turn down really good real estate deals sent in by sent in by anybody. Um, and over the years, we've actually had uh, investors send us deals and, and make money from sending us deals, which is pretty cool. Um, we're currently um, under contract on several properties uh, in Florida that inner circle members have sent us deals um, and other investors have sent us deals over the years that, that I always take a look at. Um, my question is, though, I thought you said you were guaranteed 5%. On so what level in the event of your company? So, Lynn, this is a little bit different. The Opportunity Zone Fund is different than RAD Diversified REIT. So it's a separate fund. And so over the years, we've done the 5% guaranteed distribution for RAD Diversified, Lynn, right? Um, and, and so that's something, something we've done in, in previous years. Do we accept um, from Graham, do you accept Canadian RRS IP or RAF funds. Um, I don't believe we do, Graham. We don't accept Canadian retirement funds, even though we have uh, a bunch of Canadian investors who, who invest with us and invested with us over the years. And Alan Pan, uh, one of our original investors, just you know, joined our team several years ago to become the director of international investments that helps our foreign investors with investing in the US. What exactly is Opportunity Zone investing in? Is it a brand new fund or one that's been around for a while? So, Gail, great question. So the Opportunity Zone fund is a brand new fund under the RAD Diversified umbrella. It's a specific fund for helping people with capital gains. We found that this year, especially this year, a lot of our investors um, have sold businesses. A lot of our investors have sold stock. A lot of our investors have sold uh, crypto. And they were literally coming to us and say, hey, we've invested with you guys. We believe in you, Dutch. You know, we really want to have this 
the zone. So the Opportunity Zone Fund is new under the RAD umbrella. Um, I can't do projected returns legally um, on the Opportunity Zone Fund, right? I can't sit here and say, I think we're going to hit 20% or 30% or 10% in the Opportunity Zone Fund. What I would say, even though past performance doesn't indicate future performance, we're going to keep investing the way RAD Diversified REIT has been investing for a long time. RAD, over 40% of our portfolio was already in Opportunity Zone markets. And so with our income producing farms, um, we've already identified three farms uh, that we've made offers on that are in Opportunity Zone markets. Um, we already have houses um, that we have under contract that are in Opportunity Zone markets using our same tools, our same techniques, um, our same off-the-market strategies, um, our same deal strategy strategies we've used, you know, for, for 14 years. And so, you know, we feel pretty good, you know, that we're going to be able to continue to operate business the way we've been operating it. And so, so that's, you know, best I can share with you about, about projected returns, you know, Gail, really people talk about projected returns sometimes, and, and there's not a lot of legality when it comes talking about future performance of real estate investments, right? Um, it, it, the SEC really frowns upon people saying what they're going to make with, with factors they can't control. I'll give you an example. And so there was a, there's a fund out there I see on Facebook all the time that's in, it says they're going to build fourplexes, right? And their projected fourplexes are gonna to come to the market in August of 2022, and they're projecting a 20% return. The problem with those kind of statements is that they don't know what their lumber is going to cost in 2022. They don't know what their steel, their copper, their wood is going to cost in 2022. Um, if they're saying they're going to be building and come to completion in 2022, they also don't know what their permitting process is. They don't know if they're going to get delayed in their permitting process. And I don't know if they're going to pass every single fire inspection. So to say they're going to come to market in 2022 is a little bit silly as well. And so making those kind of statements is not responsible, right? as a fund leader or as a real estate investment leader, right? I, you, you can make pro projections, but at the same time, it's not responsible. What I would say is we, we have a core philosophy of investing in off-market properties and doing value-added real estate into investing in income-producing farms and taking those, those farms and those real estate properties, increasing their income dramatically. By increasing that income, we've always been able to make really high returns, and, and, and that's exceptional. Um, Nero Moonshaw said, should we expect dividends if invested in the OZF? Um, you, we, we've thought about doing dividends in the OZF, but I'd rather do distributions. And what I mean is, Nero, if I do a distribution, you can, if I say, I'm going to go ahead and I would do a distribution out to our investors right now of, of you know, 1% of your total stock price, right? And let's say you had 100 grand invested. And I was going to do a distribution of $1,000. Now you could choose to have that $1,000, right? Stay in, right? The OZ fund, or you could choose to pull it out. If it stays in, you're not going to have a taxable event. If you withdraw it, right? Then you would have that taxable event. So I always prefer to leave it in the investor's hands to make that decision, th that decision themselves. Um, is that all those questions to the bottom? So there was yeah. more questions up above, Zach, that I didn't answer. So go ahead, scroll up. I'm just talking to our, our, our podcast ninja, Zach, um, on our team. Okay. Um, how can I get access to this recording to review? I may need it. Um, IV, thank you. Um, John, we, we will send out everybody who attended and everybody, you know, who this was, you know, shared with. We'll also send the recording out to all of you so you can have access to that. Uh, Shane Carlson said, as an undergrad in Kinesi, I remember I becoming a PAMD. I have a side happy of investments. What are investment minimums and maximums? How may I start side questions? Thoughts about cryptos. So Shane, here's the thing is if you're a med student and um, you're working on your investments, Red Diversified re upon requalification is probably a better vehicle for you, right, to invest in than the Opportunity Zone Fund. The Opportunity Zone Fund is really for people who've made you know, pretty good money and um, have capital gains they need to take care of. Um, another question for, was from Jeff Thomas. I see, I didn't think we answered it. was about depreciation. Jeff's like, Dutch, I've been investing with you for a long time. Why is my question coming last? Um, yeah. So he wanted to know, you know, you know when he sells an asset, or right, Jeff, are you unmuted? Okay, Jeff, are you? Here. You are, go ahead. You yeah, can ask a question. Here to James yourself. 
So I have uh, several different properties in, in RV and mobile home parks. They have a 15 year depreciation on those. Yeah. What happens to my recapture from the depreciation if I sell a property and invest it in the opportunity zone will be within the 180 days? I know I have to pay the capital gains in five years. I got that, but it's the depreciation I'm worried about. Depreci the depreciation is recapture is ordinary income and it doesn't count. You can't uh, you can't reinvest that. Can I just make add a couple of points to that? Um, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, it is possible to put money into a, a qualified opportunity fund that is not capital gains. I mean, if you've got $100,000 in capital gains and you decide that you like um, um, this fund so much that you want to put twice that amount in, uh, that'll be treated as two separate investments, one that qualifies for these tax benefits and one that doesn't. So you will get the tax benefits with respect to the amount of capital gains that you have invested. Uh, and anything extra that you've invested is just like an investment in a, in a corporation or in a fund in, in general. Uh, I, I should correct one thing I said earlier on. I misspoke, and I'm going to fess up to it right now. Um, the, there are two rules about holding the investments for five years and for seven years. The seven-year uh, one is that you get a uh, 5% uh, reduction in basis, um, uh, or 5% uh, increase in basis. Um, but the, um, that, that's, that's now gone because it's not possible to hold to invest now and have property held for seven years before the end of 2026. In, but the unless 5%, the uh, five year one, the ten percent does still still apply by the end of the year. So, yeah. Um, now, James, unless uh, they unless renew, they unless they renew the policy, right? And so that would be that would be the thing if they renew the the act or they they initiate another act. Um, yeah, with, if, with if you yeah, if you are continuing something that started back long enough ago that you had seven years, you may be able to to, to claim the um, yeah percent benefit but the 10 percent the 10 percent uh is, is still available till the end of the year Around so the another question um well jeff did that answer your question on the the depreciation so uh, my understanding from james is that the depreciation recapture turns into ordinary income that i would have to i would have to pay taxes on the year that i sold the property when that the is recapture correct. is that correct that okay is correct. thank you so we'd have so to can, figure out how to offset yeah. That another way. Um, another question, John, to everyone, can I have two different RAD funds, one in OZ and one in the currently RAD fund? I have the answer is yes, John, you can. Um, so the returns invested in the OZ fund from Sheely and the OZ fund is deferred until we take the distribution. But if we wait for the 10 years, then we get a step up on basis to the fair market value. So Sheely, it's deferred for five years. So if you invest today, into the OC fund, your capital gains is deferred for five years. Now, if you leave the money in the OZ fund for 10 years, the money you make from the returns, right? From while that money is in the OZ fund, then you don't have uh, a capital gain from that, from, from that income that you would, you would have made, right? And so, so there's kind of two things you're talking about. There's the original OZ fund capital gain that you would pay that's deferred for five years. And on the other hand, there's the money you make while, while your money is in the OZ fund, right? And so those are two different, you, you know, you, you got to pay attention to the taxes on those two things differently. And on the one hand, if you leave it in the 10 years, right, you're okay with, with, without the taxes. And on the other hand, you're still after five years going to be paying the deferred, deferred capital gains. Did I get that right, James? Yeah. Uh, you yeah that's well, my friend. Okay. Um, can I, I think you get stressed question? out when you hear me talk about it. Yeah. Uh, let's <laughs> look at Shelley's question. Shelley Investments to everyone. So the returns investment in the OZ fund is deferred until we take the distribution. But if we wait for 10 years, then we get a step up in basis onto the fair market value. Uh, yes, but that's not the whole story. As I say, the original amount of the gain, uh, you have to recognize um, by the end of 2026. So if you've made $100,000 gain and you don't want to pay tax on it this year, if you invest it before the end of the year uh, and you hold it for five years, uh, you, that it, the zero basis in it uh, is increased by 10% of the amount of the gain deferred. So that would go up to $10,000. $10, so then you would have to pay tax on $90,000 at the end of 2026. You then have 100, 000, at that point, you have $100,000 in basis in this uh, uh, investment. If you then hold it for the 10 years, 
uh, and you sell it, say, for a quarter of a million, $250,000, then you would have another $150,000 of capital gain, but you don't have to pay any tax on that $150,000. So that is tax free. But you have had to pay tax on the, on the original gain, less the 10% of it that you managed to exclude by holding it for, for, um, for, for five years. James, explain to them basis. A lot of people in here aren't going to understand what basis basis, basis basically means the cost of something. Uh, if you buy something for $50 and you sell it for $150, you have $100 of gain, which is the sales price, $150 minus your basis, your tax basis, which is what you paid for it, uh, the, the $50. And that basis gets adjusted for various reasons in various circumstances. Uh, the most obvious. So the basis is the original amount invested. Basis, the, the basis is essentially the cost. Basis is normally the cost, but under all sorts of circumstances in the tax law, that basis gets adjusted up or adjusted down in, in you know, for various reasons. Uh, as for example, if you depreciate something, so if you buy a depreciable piece of property for $50 and you depreciate it over, over say 10 years, uh, it's gonna depreciate $5 a year and that's going to reduce your basis in it. So that when you sell it, you've got uh, a gain um, that is, is increased by the amount of the depreciation that you've taken. That depreciation under some circumstances is recaptured and as we were just saying, is ordinary income. But the rest of the gain is capital gain. The basis is basically your cost, what it is that you're investing. But when you, in, when you invest in one of um, Dutch's funds or you invest in the Qualified Opportunity Fund, you have a zero basis in, in the investment to the extent that it represents the reinvestment of, of a capital gain, which means that if you take it out, uh, you have got all that gain that you've got to, to recognize again. So if you, um, if you put money in, you, know, you make $100,000 in capital gain, you put it into the fund, you don't wait the five years. If you take it out after three years, or I might say if the fund goes bust or you know, there's a, a, the arrangement comes to an end, uh, you will have to pay tax at that point on the 100,000. So James West has a good question. So he's, he says, I'm a new IC member with a possible 1031 event happening soon. Who's my contact to get this arranged? So um, you can always, you know, email James, you can email the relations yeah. at Rad Diversified, but it would be Gretchen O'Brien within our team. Um, also, our new inner circle coordinator, uh, Leia, Leia can, can, can help you with that. But, you know, the cool part about the Opportunity Zone Fund is you may not need to do a 1031, right? And uh, the 1030, instead the 1030, of doing the 1031 at all. Another way of deferring. The 1031 is another way of deferring gains. If you sell a piece of um, rental property or some other kinds of property. Uh, it, it has to be real estate now. It used to apply to some other things, but it doesn't anymore. Uh, if you sell a piece of real estate uh, and you reinvest the proceeds uh, in another piece of similar, like kind real estate, you get to defer that. You roll the basis, the original cost basis uh, in, the, in the first property is rolled over into the second one. And if you paid extra, then you add that to the basis. It becomes, you know, your adjusted basis becomes the original cost plus the additional amount that you've paid. Um, and that defers the gain uh, indefinitely as well. So you don't need, you don't have a gain at that point that you would uh, be trying to shelter by investing in a uh, qualified opportunity fund. Um, you can't 1031 a, um, a piece of property directly into a qualified opportunity fund. Uh, you can't just... Um, uh, Correct, but it makes the 1031, uh, it makes the 1031 unnecessary, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if yeah, you yeah. sell a property and you have a capital gain, you put the money into a, a opportunity zone fund, the 1031 is unnecessary. But it doesn't mean that a 1031 or an opportunity zone fund is better. It just means that there are different options, right? And so- well, and, the, and, the tax, and the tax treatment of the two is quite different. I mean, if, yeah. if you do a 1031 into a new piece of property, you can hold it forever and the gain is, is never realized. If you put the gain, if you sell the property and you put the funds that you've gained to the extent of the gain that you've realized, into, into the opportunity fund, you are going to have to recognize it basically by the end of 2026. You can't defer it for, for forever. Yeah, what I've what I've heard from a number of our 1031 investors is that just that they that like the endless cycle of 1031 is what they like about the opportunity zone is it kind of gives them a, a, a chance, kind of an event, right? To end the cycle, right? The never, you know, the never ending 1031 cycle. Um, and so, you know, it's just it's just a, a yin and yang. I think it depends on where you are in your investment life and your investment career and what makes the best sense for you. And so, yeah, you you guys can definitely talk to one of our team. They'll help you through it as best they can to make you know the right decision for you on what you, you want to make. Granted, we're not financial advisors, but at the same time, you know, as people invest with us, you know, we'll we'll offer you the best insight 
that we can, you know, based on your situation, what you're looking for. So um, the, I want to make sure I can get the phone number right for you guys. I know it's Rad Reap, but I don't remember if the, the front end acronym is 888 or 877. Zach from our team is going to look it up for you real quick. Um, you can also uh, email relations at raddiversified.com or dutch at raddiversified.com. Um, I prefer relations at raddiversified.com. Um, but if you really have something you know personal, significant, look, we're at almost 3,000 investors as, as a company. Um, and, you know, total, that's a lot of investors. And so though I have a very unique, special relationship with our investors and I talk to them and, you know, it doesn't matter whether you invest, you know, $5,000 or $100,000 with us, I do my best to have a, a really good relationship with all of you, right? Um, I, my, my thing is, is, is that let's get you with the team of people so I don't act as the middleman and slow it down so we can get you with, with our incredible team. So, you know, it's really fascinating. You know, we've grown from 35 people to almost 70 people as a company in the last 12 months, which is, which is true, truly amazing. She I have no capital gains this year, just regular and business income. So is it best to invest in rad? Um, so Sheila in, in that situation, rad re is probably the, the correct decision. Um, if you have no capital gains, then Rad Reed is probably the correct decision decision for you. Can I, can I just say on that, the, as I started off by saying, the statute is entitled Special Rules for Capital Gains Invested in Opportunity Zones. So this regime only uh, does anything for you if you have got capital gains and you have to reinvest those capital gains within 180 days. So if you don't have any capital gain this year, uh, there's, no, there's no juice in this for you. Yep. And so it's actually, here's the number. It's 833. You guys can put that into the chat for me too. You can just go ahead and put it in. I got it. It's 833 RAD-REIT. And then Zach will put that in there. Um, one of the sounds, looks like one of the team members put another one of our customer service phone numbers in there, but that's not directly related to the REIT. So we'll put that, the, the REIT phone number in there for you. Right. And he's going to put that in there in case you need to, you know, pick up the phone and call someone from, from the team just to be able to walk you through that Gale and, and hold your hand. Um, I like, the email long questions. So, cause sometimes you guys email, like you call us on the phone. It's great. I mean, we'll answer your phone calls all day long, but you call us on the phone and you ask like three questions, but you had 11. Right. And, and so you don't get all your answers, but when you email the long form questions and, and like, I look at them like, Whoa, that's a lot. It's like two pages of questions. But the bottom line is, is when you email over five or six or seven or eight questions, then we can go step by step and make sure and answer every single one of your questions. So, you know, both both work effectively. Um, but it's 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 uh, in case you're trying to remember that is instead of the phone number, you can just call 833 rad um, it from 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 the touch tone. So that works good. Other questions jumping in. James, other thoughts that you want to share with anybody? Tell people about the painting in the background. Oh, the painting in the background. Yes, before everybody got on, uh, Dutch was asking me about this. This is a copy made by a, um, a Spanish woman uh, a bit over 100 years ago of a painting that hangs in the Prada, uh, at the, the great museum in, uh, in Madrid in Spain. It's a picture of uh, Bacchus and some of the Greek gods drinking with the, with the Spanish peasantry. Uh, it's a, a very famous painting, and uh, for some reason I bought this at an auction some years ago, and it's been hanging in my living room ever since. Um, Hiren, so your question is, in case of no gain this year, if invested, say, 50K in OZ this year, and after 10 years, say, it becomes a total of 150K, is this 100K gain tax-free? The answer is no, it's not. So um, the... 50K has to be capital gains in order for it to apply. If it's not capital gains, it doesn't apply. But so let's say you have a half million dollars in the stock market right now, and you have $200,000 in capital gains, right, um, from this year. Now you could go and sell your stock and take the $200,000 in capital gains and put that in an OZ fund and then take the 500K and put it back into the market if you wanted to, right? And then you would still be functioning from the same functional position that you're in before, but with 200 of it being, you know, in the capital gains um, sanctuary, I guess is the way I would put it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. How many years has Rad Reap been in existence and what are the returns for each year it's been operating? So, so, so Gail, yeah. yeah, I know, and, and you can say tax shelter, but when I say tax shelter, it seems like I'm trying to hide something 
hide something. So I always say the effective utilization of the tax code. I believe the IRS should get every single dollar that they're supposed to get. We just need to make sure they're supposed to get the right amount of money. No, so, I mean, it depends how you look at it. It is, it is it, in a sense, you are sheltering capital gains on a temporary basis. Uh, but it's not an illegal tax shelter. It's There's nothing correct. inappropriate about it. It's right here in the Internal Revenue Code, 1400Z-2, you know, laid out in excruciating detail in the regulations. So, you know, you're not doing anything here that the government hasn't contemplated. I'll give you a great, I'll give you a great example. So in 2020, RAD Diversified did a 5% guaranteed distribution, right, James? Yeah. And, and we can legally do, you can legally do guarantees and investment funds. You can legally do uh, guaranteed distributions. And that's something you can legally do. But at the same time, if the IRS is mad at somebody and they were offering, not IRS, I'm sorry, if the SEC is mad at somebody, then when they when they start chastising them, they, they will really criticize that they ever offered guarantees, right? It's kind of like the same thing. If I start saying tax shelter all of the time and we ever get audited, they're going to be like, well, these guys really try to shelter their taxes and hide their taxes. So I usually don't use that word, but you're well, as a, I, as a, sorry, I as I didn't a fights the IRS, you are more than welcome question, to use it. Question about it. Uh, yeah, we do, we tend, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a term to be used with some caution. Gail Fitzer says, how many years has um, Rad Reek been in? Not to, let, let, me, let me just, let me, yeah, let me just back up and say that Go there's ahead. nothing wrong with doing this. It's a perfectly legitimate investment 100%. strategy. It's intended to encourage people to encourage people to invest in underdeveloped areas of the country so that you know people can have better lives in those places that's what this is about uh and in order to encourage people to invest in places where they might not otherwise do it the government is offering this uh this real break on on realize on the recognition of capital gains to the extent that you can defer it for some years and some of it you may not have to pay any tax on at all uh, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing this and you will not get any sort of sour looks from the irs if they ask you about it so no, it, there's, there's so that's the clip it, but it, 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 yeah that's the clip we cut zach i'm just sharing with 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 our executive producer right with our with our producer he's like i'm like that's the clip we cut for all of the trolls who go out and say what we're doing is not this or not that so that's the clip we use to to send to them anytime that, that they do it gail said how many years has rad reed been in existence and what are the returns for each year of rad reed and so that that's a good question um and so rad opened its doors in 2018 um as rad reed now the existing structure of our company and business started in 2007, and I became business partners with Amy Vaughn in 2011. And since 2007, we've run the same operations, the same company. Um, and so our first fund we opened was DHI Holdings, then we opened DDH Fund, and then we opened DHI Fund. And so we opened our first three funds. And what we wanted to do is we really wanted to open up to non-accredited investors. We wanted to open up to more a broad scale investment vehicle. And I also was working on taxation issues for people that were investing from foreign countries. And so I found that the REIT was the best vehicle for we to do that. And so we began that journey in 2016 towards becoming a REIT um, and, and literally you know, taking our existing funds and kind of going through these evolutions. And I think as a company over the years, we go through these evolutions and I see each new stage we go through is, is, is an amazing opportunity, right? I see the massive inflation, you know, that we're going through and, and the hyperinflation, you know, we'll probably, I believe we're going to go through in 2022, 2023. You know, I see it as a, a, a tremendous opportunity for us to adjust what we're doing and win in the marketplace. And so like Dana White said it great in the early 2020, when the pandemic was a lot of sports franchises were, were shutting down. He's the founder of the UFC. He's just like, I'm going to run all over you. When you and and so for me that's the adapt or die mentality when it when when it comes to to businesses and so when we opened our doors you know our first year of returns was 2019 was a 44 percent annualized return our second year was 2020 36.7 percent annualized return uh, for 2021 we're over a 30 percent uh, annualized return for Rad Reed. This is not a solicitation for Rad Reed. This is a uh, a, a podcast um, for the, our opportunity zone. But I know a lot of you are investors in Rad, and so you have qu in questions about that as well. Um, the next question is because of the intent of the law, why don't they provide some benefit to encourage investment of funds other than 
than, than capital gains. I don't know, Lonnie, that's maybe a best question for James. Call your congressman. Call your congressperson. <laughs> this is how this works. Yeah, call your congressman. Um, Gail, 26, you know, 2000 is actually 2015 to 2019. Um, I don't I don't have the, the number sitting right in front of me, but every single year for three different investment funds, we finished over 20%. So RAD has accelerated the returns in 2020, I mean, 2019, 2021, 2022. So 44, 36, over 30% in three quarters this year. We still have one more quarter um, this year before, before we finish up. Really good questions, Gail. These are all great questions. Gail, you have so many questions. Jump on the phone with one of the team and they can they can really go 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 through that. Thank you for the very impressive compliment. Gail, I tell every investor, if you tell me nice things, I'll do anything for you. It's my words of affirmation. I tell my wife all the time, just say nice things to me. I'll go conquer the world for you. There you go. Well, great, James. You know, we're, we're at the hour. I mean, it filled up quick. You shared amazing information. Um, guys, I'm going to say, like, take 10 seconds. If you ask one more question, James will answer one or two last questions, and then we're, we're going to wrap up. Um, anybody who has um, oceans and trees in, the, in, in their background, um, if you don't ask a question, we won't allow you on the future podcast. You guys have to understand, I'm looking at the Zoom, and I can actually only see about six of the 70 of your pictures. And, and I see Sandy, I can see your chin, but not your entire face. So you have to show us, you have to look down at your camera a little bit more. Well, no other questions popped in. James, thanks so much for being on, my friend. I appreciate you have been there every step of the way. You know, I believe in, in, in asking professionals professional questions. I have always believed that the more I learn in this world, the more I realize I don't know, right? Um, and that comes from a humble place of, of just, you know, acceptance, the constant learning curve as we grow and, 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 and get better. And so appreciate your insight and your advice today. And, and everybody, thanks for being on. This was our first test. Um, waving back at all of you. Um, this is our first test, you know, for doing a podcast with an audience and, and, and doing a live audience. I think it went great. Um, you guys were amazing. Uh, appreciate the questions. Really good questions. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Good. I'll hang in with I'll hang in there with you, Dutch. Just keep going. <laughs> I'll hang in there with you too, James. All right. All right. Are we done? Talk soon, brother. Okay.